The next speaker is Barry Naughton, uh, who is, I mean, for my money, the, the, the best and most comprehensible, comprehensible economist out there working on China. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that he's going to really help clarify a lot of our thinking about uh, China's economic challenge, challenges under Xi Jinping. So I'll turn it over to Barry. Thanks, Tom. Um, hey, that was a really a great morning, wasn't it? I mean, I, I do China all the time and still listening to those three guys talk and interact. It was really fantastic. Um, now, who, who here hates economics? No, seriously. Okay, we got a nice contingent there. Who, who kind of loves economics secretly, secretly nerdy? Okay, so we're evenly split. No, it looks like the economists have it. All right, I'm going to do my best to appeal to the, the haters, too, because, uh, no, I, really, I feel very strongly that economics, you know, 85% of it is common sense, but you've got the people talking about the 15% that can be really abstruse and stuff, uh, but it's, most of it's common sense. And in the case of China, um, a lot of the common sense is also part of the big picture. And, and I think if, if I were listening to this morning and I said, all right, well, what's the building on, on what people talked about this morning? What's the next thing that people would need to know about China? I think it would be number one of my three. Okay, because. I think the next thing to understand after these, these important sort of historical, social, political factors is China is also at a very particular point in its economic evolution and development. China has been going through a 35-year period of miracle growth. And that period is now over. Boom. Okay, so that's going to be crucial to understand. Let me talk about that for a little bit. So I'm going to talk about three things. One, that miracle growth has been happening and now it's over. Number two, that the economic strategy that China followed during this 30 years of, of, of miracle growth is also over. It's not going to work in the same way that it did before. And third, a little bit more controversially maybe, I'm going to argue that Xi Jinping has not yet figured out what to do. That he's got a really good political strategy. You heard Victor talk about how he has this sort of exerted control over the political apparatus, but economically, no, he's not there yet. He hasn't figured out how to handle this new set of, of circumstances. So let's talk about this miracle growth era stuff. Because I think this is important. Looking backward, and again, as, as some people in the morning said, it's the best time ever to be Chinese. Meaning that for people who live in China today, they look backwards. They say this last 30 years, oh my God, the pace of change has been so fast. Not only am I better off than I ever was, duh, I'm better off for almost everybody. I'm better off than I ever thought I would be, right? People, you know, have, people live in cities, have cars, are going on vacation. They're really like, wow, I didn't, I didn't anticipate this at this stage in my life. So it's, it's, a, it's absolutely revolutionary occurrence in people's lives. And it's also something of historical Tremendous historical significance because China, and this, I'm, this is statement is not an exaggeration, China has grown faster, longer than any other economy in the history of the human race, period, without exception. And this has nothing to do with the fact that it's a, the most populous country. So obviously whatever happens there would be important anyway, but just no, it is the fastest. So, of all the societies that we've seen transform over the last two centuries, China has transformed more rapidly than any other. So no wonder, you know, no wonder you look at China and people, you know, there's a certain element of how people act, even their emotional attitudes toward the resurgence, the rejuvenation of China. Of course they feel that way. You know, somebody my age in China has literally observed mass poverty 
and its elimination in one lifespan. Okay? So, so we really have to remember that. Now, on the other hand, two things that in a way almost go the, the opposite of what I just said, or will seem to at first. They don't contradict it at all, but still. Number one, China today is average. On a world scale, China's average. It's middle income. It's middle urbanized. China is a world. If China is a world, it's very similar to the other world. So that's another aspect of globalization, that China is now average. Even though it's bigger, crazier, faster, wilder, it's also average income level. Which, as I just said a second ago, for most people means it's not poor any longer. Okay. Now, the other thing to say is this. Although I've just been using all these incredible superlatives to talk about China, on the other hand, we'd have to say, look, what happened in China, basically, a little bigger, a little faster, but still basically, what happened in China over the last 35 years is what happened in Japan between 1950 and 1975. It's what happened in Korea between 1965 and 1995, and Taiwan over the same time, and Hong Kong and Singapore. So this phenomenon, miracle growth, a period of 25 to 30 years when an economy can explosively emerge from poverty into upper middle income status, that's something we know about. We've seen it before. China's done it bigger, China's done it faster, but it's still basically the same thing. And we kind of understand it. I say we kind of understand it because we understand the basic driving forces, which is a sort of combination. In a way, what we're talking about is a transformation where a society learns how to bring people out of agriculture and into the city at warp speed. And the only economies that have ever done that have been economies that did this in the process of opening up to the world market. So they were able to create a virtuous cycle, right, where the saving rate and the investment rate could be pushed up. And he opened up the economy enough that your cheap labor could go into the export factories. And then the exports could grow so rapidly because the whole world market was out there. And then you could just turn up this engine into warp speed, bring people from the countryside to the cities as fast as possible. Bam. It works. And that works, like I say, it works for about 30 years. Because after that, things, all those processes inevitably wind down. So here's Chinese growth rates. And basically, short story is China used to grow at 10%. Okay? And now, look at this, dun, 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 inching down, inching down. So now China is converging on growing about 6, 6.5%. Actually, probably a little bit less. There's some data problems that we don't need to talk about. But we're basically talking about an economy that used to be growing at 10%, now growing at 5%. Hey, growing at 5%, that's not bad, right? If the US economy would grow at 5%, we'd be a whole lot happier, and nobody would be listening to Donald Trump. <laughs> but we're not, that's not going to happen in the US economy. And so we're in a whole different world. But for China, this adaptation is really difficult. Now, why is it happening? Here's one very important reason. And this important reason affects, again, every aspect of Chinese society, not just the economy, but society, culture, everything. And that is the changing age structure. So this is an age pyramid. I don't know. Have, who's, who's seen one of these before? OK, so you're pretty familiar with it. Great. So you know, you know that up in the corner, that's a traditional society, where the, in a traditional society, there are lots of kids. The bottom is people 0 to 1 years old, and then 2 to 3, and then 20 years in the 80s, right? So we're moving up. So the whole pyramid moves up through time. 
this is, this is a traditional society. You've got lots of kids. Lots of babies are being born, but death rates are high, so it has slopey sides because people die at every age. And then, of course, as a society modernizes it, we naturally expect it to just become straighter-sided as there are fewer children born because birth rates go down, but also death rates are lower, so uh, there's less attrition as people move up to a higher age until you get up to 60s and 80s, right? And so here's China. So your first reaction should be, that's weird, <laughs> right? Because it is weird. For instance, there's this. How come there are no people who are 54 years old? Greatly forward. Greatly forward, exactly. Terrible famine, Mao-induced famine. That means that basically in 1961, no babies were born because times were so tough. And of course, people, many, many people died. So that's a crazy thing. And then the other crazy thing is this. We expect straight sides, but boy, we don't normally expect this. So what's happening there? What? One child policy, right? After 1980, where you first, actually, you first you get a baby boom echo, right? And then it disappears as the as the first the number of potential parents shrinks, and then each of those potential parents has one child, or if they're in the countryside, two. And so, so of course, that's a huge story. And as I think people know, this year, not 2015 rather, for the first time, all Chinese, in theory, are allowed to have two children. So this policy that has been in, a, in effect for 30 years is, fi has finally been liberalized somewhat. But look at the implications for right now. Right? The number of people graduating from college or high school is, has already dropped dramatically over the last six to seven years and is not going to rebound. And the number of people retiring is already bigger than the number of people entering the labor force. So China's labor force is shrinking. Not by a lot. Let's call it flat. Right? But after years in which, remember we were just talking about this miracle growth period. We were talking about you know, f new flood of new workers into new factories, and now all of a sudden, screech, stop. So, as you can imagine, with the supply of new workers suddenly way reduced, the price of a worker is going up. Now, of course, that's a good thing, unless you're operating an export factory. If you're operating an export factory, that's a bad thing. If you're a worker, it's a really good thing. Um, but this very dramatic shift in labor conditions is part of what's happening. Now this is kind of a, a, a goofy graph, but it, 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 uh, it shows exactly the data I want to show. These are, this is the percentage annual increase in the number of people who have a rural household registration who've left agriculture. So in 2010, the, the, the number of people, the, who, the 100 plus million of, who had left agriculture and were outside their home township was still growing 5% per year. And now, last year it grew less than a half a percent per year. Now remember, this is actually something that's conceptually completely different from this, right? Sorry, I don't mean to be skipping multiple things. This is just a picture of the total population. You can see it's got rural and urban both in there, and you can follow it if you want. But the point is, this is, ju this is just the overall age structure of the whole population. That stopped growing. In addition and separately, the great migration from rural areas to urban areas has also 
dramatically slowed down. Okay? So these two forces reinforce each other and make them and, and, and make the impact especially great if you are, for instance, running an export factory in Guangdong province. You're not finding all of a sudden there's no increase in the number of people who've come from Sichuan province on the interior or from Hunan province. This great migration where 250 million people over the last 15 years left the countryside and moved to the city has slowed, can't quite say it stopped, but it slowed way, way, way down. So all, you put all these things together, and what they mean is the, the society that just showed this incredible dynamism is unavoidably slowing down. It's going to get older fast. Now that's a funny thing to say because today it's not at all older, right? Let's go back to this, right? If we say, what's the proportion of people above 65? It's still really small. So it's still really dynamic society in the sense that, you know, you go to Beijing, you go to Shanghai, you see the people on the street, what do you see? You see these people, this mass of young adults. So you feel this excitement and the dynamism. But look what's going to happen over the next 10 years as these big groups move into retirement and this much smaller group replaces this gigantic group as the young dynamic part of the labor force. So China's going to be less dynamic economically and older. It's going to be a very, very different place within just five to 10 years. Okay. So that's, as we saw, that's already happening. Now, let's go back. Japan, Korea, these other guys. What happens? when they reach this, the end of this miracle growth phase. I've, I've selected sort of four things. Well, first of all, stuff happens that seems to indicate that the economy is going to slow down. So that's what we've already seen for China. These underlying structural things start to change slowly. And so, of course, the first reaction of the government is to say, oh, we need to keep growth going. Growth has been good for us, right? And so the government steps up credit and steps up investment in the attempt to keep the growth rate high. Hmm, that's exactly what's happening in China. Third, something happens, something unanticipated. In the case of Japan, it was the first oil shock way back in 1973. In the case of Korea, it was the Asian financial crisis in 1997. Something happens. And er at first, everybody goes, oh, well, that's unrelated to our basic problem. That's just something out there. But what happens is, pow, there's this external shock, and growth drops dramatically. So Japan, between 1950 and 1973, grew at 10.4% per year. The oil shock came, boom, and growth rate dropped to 5%, and it never again rose above 6%. Why? Well, we don't know exactly why, but I'm going to suggest some reasons in a second. And so forth, the economies after this miracle growth era, they bounce back a little bit, but they never fully bounce back. So if we were to say, What's going to happen to China? The most logical answer would be this. Just in the sense that history repeats itself, right? And most generally, we'd say, and here we're getting a little, a little bit on the geeky economic side, so this is more for the sides of the room than the center. But if we think of rules for how the, the policymakers should make economic policy. Normally, the most common rule is what economists sometimes call a Taylor rule, after John Taylor actually teaches at Stanford, right, right around the corner, which is when growth is a little slow, step on the gas. When growth is a little fast, tap on the brakes. Okay? 
usually in our economy with interest rates. In China, they use more sort of quantitative measures. But that's normally how you think of it. And of course, right now, the problem with the world economy is everybody's growth is below what they want. So everybody's flat out on the accelerator. We've got super low interest rates, super fast money supply growth, and it's not quite working. You know, where everybody's just sitting here going, God, I hope it starts to work, because otherwise we're really in big trouble. Right? But here's the problem for a country like China. When you reach the end of the miracle growth period, what's that say, 10? OK. Um, you've got to, all of a sudden, this, this rule doesn't work any longer, because you're not sure what your target growth rate is. And where China is right now is Xi Jinping has said, our target growth rate is 6.5%. And so guess what the reported growth rate is for the last quarter? 6.7%. <laughs> hmm. A little suspicious that we're tweaking the numbers a little bit to make sure we hit the 6.5% that, 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 uh, that Xi Jinping wants. So, so that's the problem. OK. So then let's go to our second, our second point, which is when we look backwards, remember I started out saying, OK, China on the one hand is spectacular, and on the other hand it's kind of just like Japan and Korea. Right? Well, how do we bring those two things together? Well, we bring it together by saying the thing that China has been really incredible about economically has been their ability to use investment as the accelerator on the car. In other words, when things slow down a little bit, it's not just, they don't just cut interest rates. The government rolls out a whole set of investment projects, right? And if you've been to China a couple times, you know this is the huge visible thing, is the enormous difference you see in the physical infrastructure from year one to year two. So here, of course, the biggest thing. Look at this. This is the high-speed rail system. There's a high-speed rail system in China. It's two-thirds done, you know? It's an amazing experience. It's much faster to get from Shanghai to Beijing now by rail than by flying because the planes never take off on time, but the trains, <laughs> trains always leave on time. And so China has learned from its predecessors by recognizing that they could drive the miracle growth period forward really fast if they just push government investment as much as possible. And it worked so far. But it worked leaving them with the economy that invests much more than any economy, again, in history has ever invested. Investment rate's incredibly high. Saving is incredibly high because household saving is high. Government saving is high and corporate saving is high. And consumption is a relatively small proportion of the economy. Household consumption in China is less than 40% of the economy, while investment is 43% of the economy in the latest data. For the United States, household consumption is 75% of the economy, and investment is about 15% of the economy. So this is just, it's a completely different economy. It means people aren't as well off as they could be by some standard. But on the other hand, investment drives this incredibly rapid growth. And there's a problem with this. Victor alluded to it before. And actually, this, this graph is a lot less alarming than Victor's statement. But, but we're still on the same page, that China has a debt problem. And that has it, the reason it has a debt problem, if you pare everything to the bone, it's because the government pushes investments that don't have a return. And so since the debt can't be repaid for these investments, an increasing share of which fall into the basket of trying to keep the growth rate high investments. And as a result, the debt ratio keeps increasing. 
So this shows sort of China's total debt ratio. This makes it look not so bad. It's 249% of GDP, which is not nearly as bad as Japan. But for a developing country, it's really high. And it's increased really rapidly. It is potentially sustainable. But it's only sustainable if China takes steps today to get it under control. But wait a minute. To get it under control would mean saying we can't keep the growth rate high by pushing investment anymore. It would mean accepting a lower growth rate. It would mean making some really difficult choices that so far they haven't been willing to make. So that's the second big challenge. So the third challenge is, well, what about economic reform? So I've said a couple times that China has, has followed Japan and Korea and these other economies in their development. And so let me take that, that same kind of logic one, <coughs> one step further and say, well, what's normal? The, uh, the first effort, of course, is to keep growth high. Everybody wants to keep growth high. They think, sure, we're special, we're different, we can grow at 8%. Maybe we can't grow at 10% anymore, we can grow at 8%. And then when it doesn't work, what happens? Well, both Japan and Korea, at this stage in their development, moved into a much more liberal, light-touch kind of policy. Japan used to be run by a thing called MIDI, right? The Ministry of Industry and Ministry of International Trade and Industry. After the early 90s, MIDI kind of stepped out. They said, well, it'll be a market economy. We'll let the corporations decide what they want to invest in. In other words, normally, quote unquote, a country shifts to a much lighter touch. And China, when Xi Jinping came to power, seemed to be going in the same direction. November 2013 was very unclear, a lot of ambiguity, but they announced a very ambitious reform policy. And to make a long story short, uh, well, let me, let me just kick off why this, this 2013 program seemed really appealing to people. They said, the market is now going to be the decisive factor in resource allocation. That sounds a lot like Japan and Korea at this stage, right? Uh, state enterprise reforms. A really important plank here was they said we're going to really reduce the barriers that keep rural people from getting full urban citizenship. And we're going to unify the market for rural land and urban land. All kinds of things. And most of them have run into roadblocks of various kinds. Now, sometimes you'll hear people who like Xi Jinping say, will sometimes say, uh, the opposition of interest groups has been much more serious than we thought. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but in any case, you'd have to say most of these policies have been disappointing. Not zero. Not zero. And as actually, a, a Chinese colleague of mine, I made a similar set of remarks in Beijing two weeks ago, a Chinese colleague of mine said, I think you're, you're it's not, I don't disagree with you, but you're being too tough on China. All countries have problems implementing their economic policies. I think you're expecting more from China. And I, you're probably right. I do expect more from China. But China has more at stake here. To make this transition successfully, a lot depends on it for China and for the world. And so far, China hasn't figured it out. And I think, and let me use these as the last two slides, I think perhaps the biggest problem is that Xi Jinping himself is divided and contradictory. He comes to power, he, he wants or wanted economic reform, sure. Because of course, 
for China to be a great country, he understands that China has to be a dynamic economy, it has to be a sophisticated, technologically advanced economy, and he understands that economic reform is necessary to achieving that. But on the other hand, he's got these political goals that in my view for the first time in the history of economic reform in China are now contradictory to the economic reform goals. So this is kind of my sense of the big objectives of Xi. Maybe today they're increasingly, it's increasingly obvious that they're subordinate to strong party leadership and strong personal leadership. But when we track the specific progress of specific economic reforms, we really start to see political obstacles undermining progress with these reforms. So state enterprise reform has stalled out because she has emphasized the party has to maintain direct control over state enterprises and their crucial building block. The promotion of high-tech industry, China's going to be a high-tech economy, no question about it, but it's going to take time. Too much government effort is going into promotion of high-tech industry. Anti-corruption program leads to fear, leads to tentativeness in the opening of markets. And one of the most alarming economic data that came out of China this year is private investment in the economy stopped growing as people worry about where this trajectory is taking them. So let me stop there. That's why I think we're at, we're at a, a crucial moment where the po politics are interfering with the dramatic task that China has before it, which is totally doable, which is to make this transition to medium high speed growth, but put it on a sustainable basis. Thank you very much, Barry. <laughs> Questions? Yes, hello. I, I, uh, your analysis is very powerful, and, and uh, one of the things that I see that is missing is that the investment in uh, technology, uh, if it were directed toward consumption about service-oriented economy, there's all kinds of room for growth. And, and it, if it were directed towards you know, green energy, healthy environment, all those things have great potential for growth and, and, and could solve this dilemma. And I, my sense is that they're, they, Chinese leadership is aware of this. They're pushing a little bit in that direction, but of course, uh, maybe a little stronger than the US, <laughs> but it's not, not enough yet to solve this problem. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I very much agree with you. And, uh, uh, but not everybody agrees with us. Um, I, I'm like you. I think that the, the push towards a service economy and a decentralization and opening of markets has been too weak. Now, you know, again, some, some Chinese economists think, oh, you know, these things take time. You're too, you're too impatient. They say, well, the, the share of services in the current price economy is now over half. It's 52%. And that's better than where we were. So they say, well, we're making progress. So there, there is a, another side. But I'm with you. I think they could be doing much more in that. And it would drive a much more dynamic transition. Yeah, um, kind of on that same vein. Earlier, when you were talking about the population trees, you said that more people are retiring now than entering the workforce. And that's going to increase. And then here you say that the economic reform, specifically the aggressive promotion of high-tech industry, is assertive nationalism. Is it also possible that by pursuing like high tech industry and high tech industry production, um, that's a way of dealing with, you know, the workforce issue? Definitely. And uh, I don't know if anybody saw it. Like three days ago, there was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal about a uh, restaurant in Beijing that has little robots delivering the food. <laughs> <laughs> now, and it was just a gimmick, right? It was, but. Um, So if, if we kind of get inside the mind of policymakers, what they're saying is, well, wait a minute. 
we've got all this money and we can still invest it in things. And we're reaching these huge turning points. Let's pour all of that money into high technology and let's pour it into robotization. Let's pour it into electric vehicles. Let's pour it into integrated circuits. And let's drive the high-tech transformation of the economy and substitute capital for labor. Okay. So that's a logically coherent view. And so you're absolutely right. Does that mirror what Japan did in the, in the 90s? Well, uh, so the big thing in Japan is that there's this huge bifurcation between the really super efficient, you know, corporate high tech manufacturing sector and a really still very inefficient services sector. Uh, and Korea is the same way. I think, unfortunately, China is, seems to be doing the same thing. And in my view, uh, first of all, China is still considerably poorer or less rich, let's say, than Japan and Korea were by the 90s and the 2000s. And so I think this strategy, there are just limits. Uh, there's two limits that come into play with this strategy. One is you've got the government with way too much say in what types of investments actually get made, and it's a big problem. The other is high tech is super important, but it's still a relatively small share of the total economy. And especially in an economy where you've still got hundreds of millions of people who are in relatively, you know, relatively menial occupations, it's, it's an overemphasis. Over uh, but that's not absolute truth, that's just an opinion. Yes. I have a question about the government doing anything to fix the economy. I come across a point in time in here, and I have a lot of very affluent people. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Hi. Um, I'm wondering, is the Chinese government doing anything to remedy the environmental problems? Because I am from a private school in Honolulu, and we have a lot of very affluent students that come to Hawaii because they move with their mothers. Father stays back in Beijing or Shanghai, and they say they come to Hawaii because they are too sick there because of the pollution and the contamination and um, the, the educational system, and they want to get into a good American university and probably never go back to China. And they said if they stay in China, they'll probably be dead by the time they're 30 because of the water and the pollution and the air quality. And um, Sure. So, I mean, if they don't do anything, all, all these people are going to be dead. Yeah. Uh, so it, no, it's really bad. They're dying at 30. And no, I, I know. I live in Beijing a lot, yeah. of, a lot of part of the year. And uh, so I would say um, Thank you. There, it, it's definitely a, it's a very, very important problem. Has very serious health consequences. Um, definitely, the Chinese government is doing a lot now. Whether they're doing enough, that's a whole different question. Pollution in Beijing, it's a little bit better. Um, emissions are down significantly, but you've still got you know kind of legacy issues too. Uh, so you know, coal production is down. Increase of wind and solar facilities connected to the web is much more in China than in other countries. So I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to prettify it. It's it's really polluted. It's a major problem. Uh, Uh, I can't. I can't quite hear. Uh, all these things. My, my ears are fogging. Like they, uh, eggs that are made from chemicals and you know, fake food and there's no like control over the food that's being processed. And I, I'm hearing this from my Chinese yeah. students. Whether they're just blowing it out of proportion. Uh, they're or, exaggerating, but okay. But but they're not making it up. Okay. Right. They're they're maybe exaggerating the importance. I, I guess here's and I have Japanese students too sure. that are saying things too. Sure. I, I would the, the way I bring this together it would be this: 
if the Chinese spent half of the effort they spend on strengthening the party, on strengthening the regulatory apparatus, then China would be a much healthier and happier country. And, and, and we see that in many areas of economic reform. I didn't put it up here, but you know, independent regulatory bodies. Boy, if there was any one missing piece of the puzzle for China, that's it. Thank you, Thank you Barry. I'm sorry because of time. I'm going to turn it back over to Tom for the last speaker, the intro to the last speaker. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>